Amen, amen. Here's where we begin. Uh, we begin with Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus Christ said when he was summarizing his mission in this world, he says, the son of man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now I need to engage your brain right away. He says to, to give his life as a ransom for many. That word ransom there, that's a weird word. It's a cool word. What does ransom mean? Ransom implies somebody has been kidnapped. Yes? Who's been kidnapped? It implies someone's been kidnapped and someone has to pay something in order to set the kidnapped person free. What in the world is going on here in Jesus's picture? Our choices kidnapped us, all of humanity, Amen. for all of time. Our choices kidnapped us. Our selfishness kidnapped us. Your greed kidnapped you. Your pride put you in chains. Your ego bound you up to where you could barely move. Countless choices cha chained you up, chained up your kids, chained up your community. Yes, like, like we look out and, and we endure, if we're honest with ourselves, we endure a very dark world. But it is not the darkness that someone else created. It is the darkness that we created. We made it this way with those countless choices, bound up, in bondage, trapped, and somebody had to ransom us out. And so, again, logically, how do you ransom them out? Well, you need someone who can pay the price. And how do you ransom guilty people? You need to find somebody innocent, actually innocent. There's only one who came and lived an innocent life. There's only one who came and lived a sinless life. He's the only one who was ever qualified to die for our broken humanity. And because our sin was great and the justice bill, the debt was so great to pay, he had to even die for us. Amen? Amen. Jesus had to die. So Jesus was crucified. And many of you know the story. Why did Jesus have to die? Because someone had to pay. And so he was betrayed and he was arrested and he was falsely accused and he was tortured and he was mocked and he was put on a cross for a slow, torturous death. And while he was there, he forgave all of humanity to the father. He said, father, forgive them. They know not what they do. There was even a, 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 a sinner on the cross right next to him who needed personal salvation. Jesus reached out to him and loved him because that's his nature and he can never stop being who he is. Jesus was there to save humanity and sometime late Friday afternoon, he died. And so Nicodemus and Joseph, they went to Pilate and they begged for his body, if you know the story. And they took his body down from the cross and, and they wrapped it in linen and, and they took it to a new tomb uh, to bury him. And his, his female disciples who Jesus had called, who Jesus had, had asked for them to help him support his ministry, who had followed him for three years, they were right there. They had not deserted him and they went and helped take his body to the tomb with perfume and spices, but they couldn't do much because it was Friday night and it was almost sundown and they believe that you could not dishonor the, the Sabbath, especially the Passover Sabbath. And so they had to get out of there before the sun was down. But they wanted to honor their king more. And so the women went home, these, these women disciples went home and they prepared more spices and they, they prepared more perfumes to honor this king that they used to love who had been so great and wonderful, worked so many miracles. And you notice I'm using the past tense because they would have used the past tense. Do you realize that? Everybody thought it was over. Everybody thought he's now dead. Everything that we thought is not true. It's over. And so that is where we find them on Sunday morning, Luke chapter 24, verse one. But very early Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared because they're here to honor Jesus's body. And they found surprisingly that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. And so they went in 
but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. See, they're not asking the question about resurrection yet. They're just confused. They might not have been mourning people. Come on, man. That was one of the jokes. <laughs> Jeepers. They might not have been mourning people. A any of you a little slow in the morning? Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> Taking things in and like you're here, but kind of not here. You're awake, but kind of not awake, right? Takes you a little bit longer. I, 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 I get it. That's kind of the image that I get of these ladies here. It's like they're seeing all this data in front of them, but they don't know what's happening. And there's these two angels in front of them talking. So verse five, the, the women were terrified and they bowed their faces to the ground. And then the men asked them, these two angels asked them, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? What a great question. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what Jesus told you back in Galilee that the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. Why would you come to a graveyard looking for a living king? Why would you do this? It's such a funny question. Well, of course they did this. Dan addressed that in the video. Of course they would do this, but the angels know what's going on. They know the whole universe just turned upside down. They know for the first time in human history, a human being decided to res resurrect from the dead. And he defeated death. Your Lord defeated death. Amen. And they get it. And it just makes logical sense to them. When we were together as pastors, uh, Pastor Mike Keebone, this is one of his insights. He kind of sees the angels um, as more logical creatures. Like they're just reading the data. They're, they're, they're maybe a little bit like Spock in Star Trek. And it's like, he told us he was going to do this. Why didn't you believe him? This seems easy to us, but it's not easy, is it? Because we've got old things that we believe and it's hard to believe new things. We've got emotion and we've got hurt and we've got shock at things that we didn't expect to happen. And of course, we're getting over all of that stuff. Well, why, why would you look for a living person amongst the dead? Verse eight, then they remembered that Jesus had said this so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 male disciples, by the way, and everyone else what had happened. So these women disciples went back to tell the male disciples that Jesus had risen from the dead. And the men do not believe them at first. You can make out of that whatever you would like to make out of that. Also, I just need to point this out. Jesus had called these female disciples. Um, they had been faithful to him and he gives them the trust and the honor of being the very first witnesses to this resurrection. Make out of that whatever you want to make. It's a big deal. Okay. Have you noticed this? It, it's hard to miss, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Do you even know what this is? <laughs> I could probably guess your age, um, maybe. Um, I know what this is. Um, listen, you ready? Isn't it beautiful? It's a beautiful sound. I miss it. It's called, it's called a rotary phone. Okay, <laughs> this is how it used to be done. Um, so these things, um, they had to be mounted to a wall and there was a cord on them and you could only go as far away as the cord. I mean, yeah, indoor plumbing and all of that. Um, and you had to know people's telephone numbers back in the day. You couldn't just like press their name like we do today. Like many of you have never memorized anybody's telephone number. I remember the telephone number we had when I was a kid, 309-347-6949, still remember it. 
because everything had to be memorized. And, and we thought we were like super cool. This was mounted in our kitchen, by the way. We thought we were super cool because we had like a 20 foot cord and you could go pacing around the house, talking to people on the phone. We were so high tech. I'm not getting nearly as many laughs as first service <laughs> because I think maybe we were older in first service, but um, you had no privacy. I remember asking um, for the very first time a girl out on a date when I was a teenager on the phone mounted in our kitchen. And you can bet my sisters were listening in and she did not accept. And it was devastating. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Pity the pastor. That's really, really good. <laughs> I'm sure Linda was glad that it went that way uh, for sure. Um, okay, so then Steve Jobs comes along and he brings us the iPhone, right? You can play Wordle on your iPhone, let alone make calls. And then you can just go, you can search for somebody's name and you just hit the name and it magically dials them. And you can go anywhere. You're not stuck in any one location. And you can go and be turned down by girls wherever you want to <laughs> in the privacy of wherever you're going to be. Mm. So... With an iPhone out there, why would anybody use this? They wouldn't. It's just a real basic idea. If you've got all the blessings of what's new, why would you go back and hold yourself to what's old? It's essentially, it's the angel's question. Why would you? Don't you realize what Jesus has purchased for all of us? Don't you realize what has gone on, how different the universe is today than it was yesterday? So why would you live in your old life as if the new way is not here? And this is what we're going to explore. The Apostle Paul talks about the idea that there are three big blessings that come from the resurrection. And so I'm going to uh, dive into those three big blessings. I'm going to show that to you. So when Jesus died and was raised again, when he paid your ransom and then came out of the tomb, when he did that for you because God loves you, when Jesus did that, you got three big gifts from Jesus, whether you know it or not. And sometimes we live as if they aren't there. So Paul talks about this, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. And when Paul's talking here, you're gonna need your brains for just a second. He's talking to some skeptics of Jesus' resurrection. Can you believe there were skeptics even in Paul's day? Weren't sure whether or not they believed. So he's talking to them, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, he said. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. And he, of course, he's talking about death came through Adam, but resurrection and life came through Jesus Christ. They were the entry points for those two things. But he says, Christ has been raised from the dead, but Christ wasn't, been, he, he wasn't raised from the dead to be the only human being become immortal. He came to start a nation of immortals. He came to start a nation of people that would be resurrected just like him. He was the first of a whole harvest of people who would die and who would come out of their graves. If you are in Christ Jesus today, you will certainly die. And if you know Jesus Christ today, you will come out of that grave again. That is the great promise. So if Jesus rose... You do not have to fear death anymore. Well, that's a tall order. I've been in three ICU hospital rooms in the last three or in the last two weeks. Fear of death is a, is a thing. Fear of death drives us. Fear of death drives us to succeed. It drives us to control family members. It drives us to protect our legacy, to try to build something we think will be our legacy, to try to force people's hand to remember us longer and longer after we die, even though none of that ever works because they sell all of us in a garage sale. Amen? Amen. But this fear of death, it's big for us. 
Jesus died so that we would not have to fear death because he's purchased us eternal life just like he has. So why would we fear death? That's the angel's question. The next blessing, look at this, verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty in your sins. Paul's flipping it. He's like, if, if, if there's no resurrection of Jesus, then here's something you don't have. You don't have, a, you don't have forgiveness. You're still guilty in your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Okay, now I really need your brains. Here's what he's saying. He's saying Jesus Christ came and claimed to be God, yes? And he claimed that he was gonna be able to forgive us our sins. He claimed that he could pay the ransom on the cross for us. These are huge claims. He claimed to be the source of all truth. He claimed to be the only way to God. He claimed to be the life. This was Jesus. How do we know his claims were true? If he did not come out of the tomb, we would not know his claims were true. Amen. He would just be some other wacko down through human history making claims that were far beyond them. The resurrection is the proof that you can believe everything that Jesus said. Amen. That's why Paul says, if he didn't come out of the grave, then we're all still lost. We're all still in our sins. None of us have been forgiven. We all still have shame. We all still have a past. We are not right with God. We're still a broken humanity. But Jesus did rise. And if Jesus rose, then you are forgiven. If Jesus rose, then he did clean up your shame and your past. And you don't have to go back and keep revisiting it every single day. God's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Jesus purchased that for you, that you could forgive you. Jesus did rise. You are forgiven. The scripture even says he's cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. God has forgiven you and Jesus bought it for you. This is this part of, of the gift of what Jesus has given. This is like you winning the eternal lottery. There's so much in this. This changes everything. I can't overstate this blessing. So verse 32, and what value was there in fighting wild beasts, those people of Ephesus, <clears throat> if there will be no resurrection from the dead? And if there's no resurrection, let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. What in the world is he talking about? Wild beasts from Ephesus. Let me explain this just for a second. Paul was a missionary in the, in the New Testament in the first century. Paul went around and planted churches in the ancient world. He went to a city called Ephesus. And when he was at that city called Ephesus, guess what? He's planting a church and there's a temple. And as Paul planted his church and his church got bigger, guess what? The temple got smaller. And people who were leading up that temple got mad. Ever hear of religious competition? Yeah. They got mad. And so they started a riot in the town of Ephesus and they tried to have Paul and his fellow missionaries killed. So living as a missionary is not easy life. It's tough life, maybe even violent, risky life. That's what Paul's trying to say. And Paul's trying to say, why in the world would I endure that and go through that if Christ hadn't been raised from the dead? If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then that means there's no judgment. We're not sure about God. We're stuck in our sins. There's no point in trying to rescue anybody else. We may as well just live for us. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. May as well live for you. What an empty life, but it's the most logical life if Christ has not been raised, but he has been raised. He has risen from the dead, which means all of a sudden your life has a purpose. Amen. Because his life had a purpose to come and serve everyone around him and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you are a Christian today, you have the same exact mission statement, not to be served, but you serve and give your life as a ransom for as many people as possible to find Jesus. So Jesus bought you three big things. Here they are. Three big gifts. Forgiveness and release from guilt. 
freedom from the fear of death, and a new purpose to live for others instead of living for yourself. <sighs> Praise God, amen. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son to die for us. If we believe in him, we can have eternal life and not perish. Why would you? Why would you? If he's given us all of that, all to ransom you. Uh, just want to acknowledge, maybe you're in a space today spiritually. I don't have a spiritual x-ray machine to look at you and know exactly where you're at with God. Maybe you're in a spot where you've never given your life to God before. Maybe you've still got questions. Maybe you're seeking. Maybe you're just starting down this road. <clears throat> if you have not given your life total surrender of your soul to Jesus Christ yet, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that, to take that step at the very end of the service today. So hold on, because I got to talk to the Christians first. Some of you are laughing, yeah. I gotta talk to the Christians first. If you are a Christian and you know Jesus, why would you? Why would you live in guilt? Why would you fear death? Why would you live for yourself? If you know Jesus today, could I just talk to you for a second? How's your life going? <clears throat> Are you still stuck in your past and in your shame? Are you still stuck with not forgiving yourself? Why? Why are you doing that when he's given you so much? Why would you fear your death? Why would you, um, why would you fear cancer? If I could just be that blunt. Why would you do everything in your power to lengthen out your days? instead of using your days to rescue as many other folks as possible to Jesus. We get so confused in this world, don't we? And then why would you live for yourself? Um, I get it. We grew up in it. It's all about us. It's all about accumulating as much wealth as we possibly can. I get it. It's all about infinite doom scrolling of social media ad nauseum, right? And like on and on and on it goes to build up your reputation, to build up control over your family, to build up all the things that, that you expected to have in your house, in your car, in your retirement, and all the things that were always supposed to be coming to you because America promised that they were coming to you. And that's all you living for yourself, now we're called to give ourselves away. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life away as a ransom for many. So why would, why would you live for you? Um, and as Christians, we, we have this way sometimes where we know something makes a whole lot of sense up here, but it's never moved down to our heart. Big distance, isn't it? And we know the theology of it and we went to class but it's never come into our life? Just asking you that question. Okay, I have a magic trick for you. Takes just a second. Okay, these flowers are dead. I killed them. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I went and bought them. And um, I think Wednesday, and um, I put them in the oven because that's what Google said would kill them. <laughs> and so they're, they're dead. They're dead, dead. They're fully dead. Um, so here's the magic trick. Okay, I'm going to take my dead roses and got some water here. Okay, sorry. Um. <laughs> and it's one, two, presto, and they're still dead. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome, right, right? Um. 
Why are they, what, what, that was the trick. Um, <laughs> they're still dead. Here's the thing. You can't throw water at dead flowers and expect them to revive because they're dead. We all get that. Quit saying it. I know. Why? Because when they will, they're still alive. You can revive them. But when an organism crosses a certain threshold, it is dead, dead. It can no longer be revived, right? The, the, the cells have broken down the cell walls and, and, and it's dried up and there's no life in it at all anymore. There's nothing to revive. It is an impossibility to bring it back to life by throwing some water at it. You cannot revive a human soul by throwing religion at it. You cannot be, as the Bible calls us, spiritually dead and throw prayer and church attendance at yourself and expect for it to make a difference. You can't throw theology, you can't throw Bible at yourself and suddenly expect to be alive again. You can't. You can't. One preacher said it this way, Jesus Christ did not come to make bad people good, but to make dead people alive. Amen. A miracle has to happen in you. Yes. Is the only way that this works. Sure. It's got to be a miracle because there's no other way we're going to see living flowers again. There's no other way we're going to see a living soul in you again it, with, outside of a miracle uh, God said it like this in Ezekiel. He says, I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. He's describing the miracle of the human heart right there. He says, you don't realize how bad it is. You don't realize how far away you are. Guys, you, you've been so far from God for so long. You don't know what prayer actually is because most of your life, you've only really depended on yourself. And you've only trusted yourself. How in the world can you walk in faith if you've never trusted anybody but you? Not really. You're going to suddenly start trusting and showing faith in a supernatural God? You can't. You're not built for it. A miracle has to happen inside of you. God has to remove stone and put a heart of flesh there. Jesus said it like this. John 6, for no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them to me. And, and at the last day, I will raise them up. See, in promising resurrection there again for us. But he's saying, listen, it's, you can't do it. You can't try hard enough to make you better. That's the state of things. No one can come to Jesus unless the father draws them. And, and I love that. How cool. Helkuo is the Greek word that's behind that word draws. What it actually means is drags. The father has to drag you to Jesus. It's the only way it works. Is the picture starting to come into focus now? You're like, but I got all these reasons not to go. I know, we all do. And I've tried before and I've... I've tried out Jesus and I've tried out church and it just didn't work. It just didn't revive me. I, I, I've got all this stuff in my past. If you only knew my story, there are all these different things that I attempted to do and, and I'm just not different. And guys, it's, it's a miracle that has to happen inside of you. And you know people who God has done that miracle in them. He dragged them all the way to Jesus and he resurrected their soul. Because when that happens, something different happens. And again, you've met those people. You've talked to them. Oh my gosh, you're different. And some of you in this room, you've had that experience for yourself. It's like... I, I've done all these things in the past, but man, I crossed some kind of line here and now I care about what Jesus thinks. Now I find myself loving God for real, not because I'm trying to, but because it just pours out of me. My appetite for sin, all the sins in this world, 
my appetite just starts to dry up for those things when God has done the miracle in me. And I'm not saying it's all day one, but he changes your affections. He changes your loves. All of a sudden, everything starts to move around inside of you. That's a miraculous work of Jesus in your heart. The miracle has to happen in you. You got to get dragged to God. Don't try your way into life, please. The prayer is, God, would you drag me home to Jesus? Would you resurrect me and make me a new person, God? <laughs> You're like, I'm about eggs, bunnies, and lunch right now. And you think, you know, the spiritual world's gonna turn upside down for me. Yes, your eternity hangs in the balance today. Even on a holiday, it hangs in the balance today. So I wanna pray for you. Would you guys stand? I'm not gonna call anybody out or make anything weird, I promise. Would you guys bow your heads and close your eyes? First, I want to pray for, and I want to pray with those of you who are like, I don't know that the miracles ever happened in me. Not for real. And maybe I've tried, but it's all been throwing water on dead plants. And so I want it to be real this time. If that's where you are, I'm going to walk us through a prayer. And, and here's the scripture that's behind the prayer. It says in Romans chapter 10, that if you will confess that Jesus is Lord, if you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Amen. And the Bible makes it so simple for us. If you confess with your mouth, if you say it, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my King. You're the one who's in charge of my life. That's what the word means. I'm gonna no longer be in charge. You're gonna be in charge. It's surrender if I could put a word to it. Every square inch of my soul, I surrender to you, Jesus. I give it to you, Jesus. And then I believe in my heart, God raised him from the dead and someday he can raise me then you'll be saved. So as we pray this prayer, you're gonna speak these words in your, own, in your own way. And it can be out loud. It can just be on the inside. God hears you regardless. Heaven is listening and it matters. So dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for Easter. Come and save me. Would you ransom me from this kidnap I've been in all my life? Would you forgive my past, forgive my sin, forgive my guilt, forgive my shame? I've carried it around too long and I wanna be free of it. Jesus, would you pay for me? And Jesus, would you now come and Lord, would you bless my life, God? And, and Lord, it's a, it's a life that I give to you 100%. You're in charge now. They're not my resources, my schedule, my retirement, my, my days, my family, my everything. God, it's all yours now. I give it to you. I've made a mess of it anyway, Jesus. Come and fill me. Come and change my life. In Christ's name, amen. Yeah. The scripture says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. I said before, eternity hangs in the balance and that's true. If you were connecting with God during that prayer, angels rejoiced in heaven. Amen. You just changed the fundamental spiritual DNA of your soul just changed. Praise God for that. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes again. I'm gonna pray for the Christians. God, many of us saw that list today and we would have to confess that it's been in our heads and never moved to our heart. 
Or maybe we've been in a spot where we believed those things and walked in those things, God, but we don't anymore. And, and maybe we're still holding on to control, Lord. Maybe we're not trusting you, God. There's all kinds of reasons that may be, but God, there's a part of us that's dead and needs your resurrection. So Jesus, would you drag us, drag us back to yourself, resurrect our heart of stone, Jesus. We wanna walk in life again. So we ask for the miracle. We love you, Lord, in Christ's name, amen.